Church, today, as we continue in our series, Vision to Conquer, and we study the story of David and Goliath, we are going to be talking today about conquering faith killers. Now, we know that it is by faith that we are saved. That's how our relationship with Jesus Christ begins. But that relationship continues by faith. We know it is founded in the Word of God and through prayer Because the Holy Spirit lives within us that we are able to go forward, know the will of God, and accomplish the will of God for His glory, not our own. But that process after salvation is a process of faith. And that faith that we are called to live by comes under attack. And we are going to see very clearly today that David, this young shepherd boy, who loved God and had great faith in God, that his faith will come under attack. Now, most people think that the, uh, when you think about this particular chapter, you think about David, the young shepherd boy, and this huge giant. But I am going to help you see today, by God's grace, that the first giant that he had to face was the critic's that surrounded him. And if he couldn't overcome that particular hurdle, that his faith would not go forward to even face the giant that came out to defy the living God. We need to understand this because some here today, you're living in defeat. You're discouraged. You're not sure God has a plan for you anymore. You're not sure that God even works anymore. But there's a reason for that. And it's because The enemy, in some way, some form, some fashion, has convinced you that God doesn't have a plan for your life, that God's Word is not powerful, that God is not working, that ultimately, if you boil it all down, what you come to the conclusion is God's not able. But that's just not true. You need to believe today, like never before, that God is able. And to do that, we have to learn how to conquer the faith killers. Those fears and those foes that come after our faith. These deadly faith killers literally are everywhere. You say, really? Yes. Yes, they are. You say, why is that? It's because faith in God that can overcome the Goliaths in our life is the type of faith that sees God for who he is and what God can do in relation to any giant, any situation, and it is that kind of faith that the enemy will attack. It is that kind of faith that believes God has a purpose for my life. You believe God has called you to serve him. You believe that sharing the gospel impacts a soul for eternity. And so you share the gospel That's the kind of faith that the enemy is going to come after and try to stop. Now, if your faith is, oh, I believe in God, but I'm just going to go do my own thing. If your faith is, well, I'll just be a good person, and you don't really enter the spiritual battle, you don't really believe God's word, you don't apply God's word, and you don't engage into the spiritual activity of seeing lives changed by the word of God, you'll never understand what a faith killer really is. Because you've got to have the kind of faith that needs to be stopped. And that's the kind of faith that David had. And he had to deal with it. You know, there was a story told many, many years ago about Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was a very powerful preacher. If you go back and read his sermons, you will see that he stood in the pulpit and he was able to graphically, uh, Holy Spirit-filled, preached the Word of God with great power, and many people's lives were changed. But Many people were critical of him as well. And that's how that goes when you serve the Lord. But there was a story told about Charles Spurgeon. And here's how the story goes. It says, one day, a man met Mr. Spurgeon on the street. He took off his hat, and he bowed, and he said these words, the Reverend Mr. Spurgeon. And he took his hat off, and he's saying these words, the great humbug. And so he's mocking him. What did Mr. Spurgeon do with this critic? Well, he took off his hat and he replied 
with his hat off, and he said, thank you for that compliment. I'm glad to hear that I am a great anything. Now, the reason I tell you that story is, it's very profound, because Mr. Spurgeon was immediately able, not to just put him in his place, but to put the critic into perspective. To take the focus off himself and say, listen, if there's anything good about me, it's because of God. I'm glad to be a great anything. But ability to put your critics into perspective quickly that way, it only comes from God. What most of us would have done is we would have gone and gone over to one of our friends and said, can you believe that man said that? Can you believe he, he has confronted me out here in the community, in the streets, and saying things like that? Something needs to be done about that. Now, Spurgeon didn't go and talk about it. He just dealt with it and put it into perspective. Sometimes we like to talk about our critics instead of overcome our critics. We've got to learn how to put our critics and their comments into perspective. Some of you here today, you're not winning this battle. You're allowing your critics to shape and form your thinking about yourself. They are shaping and forming how you view God and what God will do in your life. And you need to be able to overcome your critics. Stop allowing them to have the greater voice in your life than God having the voice in your life that says he can do anything with you. You know, it could be that Satan has gotten into your head through other people. Saying things like this, oh, you're never going to be a great parent because your parents weren't great. Oh, really? You're telling me that you can't surrender to the Lord and raise your children in a way that honors God, that the generational curse can't be broken? It can. You, you may have it in your mind that you can never serve the Lord because of your past sin. But, but the last time I checked, that, that God's message of salvation is all about being forgiven of sin overcoming sin and living in victory by the word of God but some of us think oh well, I can't do anything because I did that but doesn't God forgive that doesn't God put that in perspective and and he turns it into a stepping stone not a stumbling block the answer is yes he does but some of you don't really believe that he may be in your head telling you you can never teach, preach, share the gospel, do missions. Whatever it is that you want to put there, you fill in the blank. But some critic, some human being by the enemy has come to you and said something to you that has held you back, held you down, and caused you to retreat instead of live in victory. And you've got to overcome these faith killers. And what I want to say to you today is let's conquer our faith killers. And if we're going to do that, I want us to see three observations that you should ponder concerning how David overcame them. Three things that we're going to see here in just a moment. You know, last week, Philip Yancey, I quoted him by saying that faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. And see, David had that kind of faith. And it's that kind of faith that comes under attack when you begin to believe God for what he wants to do in and through your life. He knew that this giant was no match for God. But those around him, I want you to stop and think about this. Family members, leadership, who is Saul, others, all these fighting men. There was not one in the bunch that had the faith to believe what David was believing. They didn't believe it could happen. Literally, they all became faith killers. See, we will be defeated not by the giant, but by the very ones afraid of the giant. You ever thought about that? David is standing in a virtual sea of fear. Saul is fearful. The whole army is fearful. His brothers are fearful. Everyone is fearful. No one has the courage and the faith to come and say, you know what, David? You're right. This giant is not bigger than the living God. And the fact that he is defined... This is wrong. This has got to stop. We've got to do something about it. Not one person backed him up. See, David must first battle the fear-filled critics before he can battle the giant. I want you to write these three things down if you're taking notes because this is how it usually works. It's like this. First, you battle yourself. You say, am I, am I, can I be available to the Lord? Can God use me? Well, David had settled that. He had seen God work by um, killing the bear and the lion. He'd seen God work in his life. He knew God 
could work through his life. Age was not an issue. Status was not an issue. Position was not an issue. He simply knew God, loved God, and wanted God to be honored. But see, you first battle yourself. You've got to settle the fact that God wants to do something in and through your life. Then secondly, you will typically battle your critics. And your critics could be friends. I remember when God called me into ministry and I knew that God had something bigger for me or something different for me than I'd ever imagined. And I began to talk about that, share about that. And I had some of my closest friends go, really? That's what you want to do with your life? And they became critics. And I had to believe what God was leading me to do. I had to believe with the activity of God in my life. And I couldn't see it clearly where I was going to go, how it was going to happen. And they say, well, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? How is this going to work? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure exactly. I just know God's doing this. And see, I had to believe God. But the critics will be many that will question the activity of God in your life. So first you battle yourself, then you battle your critics, and then thirdly, you will battle your giants. All three battlefields call for faith and perspective in God. But today we enter the arena of the battlefield of our critics. we got to face that first if we're going to face the giant. It's a very interesting article written by the Civil Air Patrol. And it recounts the history of the Wright brothers. It's always been a fascinating story for me to think about and consider. Today we take for granted the fact that we go out to the airport, we get a ticket, we get on a plane, and we fly just about anywhere in the world we want to go, and it's a no big deal, right? As long as the door doesn't come off the plane, we're good. Well, listen, this whole thing started with the Wright brothers, and here's what the Civil Patrol wrote about that reality. It said, finally, on December the 17th, 1903, Orville climbed on the lower wing of the new biplane and with full throttle and a wind of 24 miles an hour, launched from a rail into the air for a flight of, are you ready for this, 12 seconds. He flew at an altitude of 12 feet and he went forward 120 feet. Now that's not a very long flight. There were five witnesses who observed the aircraft in flight. It was the first controlled, sustained, and powered flight in history. And because of this, Wilbur and Orville Wright are, re are revered as the founders of powered flight. Now, I want to say to you that was not an easy task. We take it for granted today, but they were believing in something. They were working on something no one thought could possibly ever happen. At that time, man-powered flight was nothing more than a fantasy. It believed to be something that was impossible. Powered flight was for the birds, argued the critics. But the Wright brothers received more than their share of criticism and ridicule, but it did not discourage them from pressing forward in what they believed could happen. I can hear them saying now to Wilbur and Orville, you can't fly, that's for birds. <laughs> oh, you can't do that. That's impossible. It's never happened before. Now, can you hear the critics talking about that? Can, can you hear that? But it makes no sense to us because we fly all over the place today, right? But back then, it seemed an absolute impossibility. And I want to say to you, I can hear them saying to David, you can't fight the giant. You're only a shepherd boy. You, you can't do it. I can hear them saying, you can't beat this giant. There's no way that you're going to win this. There's just absolutely no way. So the critics' voices were strong. They were powerful. But yet, amazingly, David is not moved by that. He has an ability to overcome the critics within his heart and mind, knowing that God is capable so firstly, I want us to see David's courageous faith. Verse 30 and 32 says this. He then turned away to someone else, and he brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of the Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. 
In verse 32 follows David encountered with Elab and his response to Saul. Both of these encounters, they reveal the courage and the faith of David. Yes, Satan brings roadblocks into our life. And he desires to fill us with the fear of our critics to cripple our faith. And when this happens, ultimately what we're doing is we're questioning the activity, the capability, the will of the living God in our lives. Somehow we've got to overcome it. I began to think this week as I was working on this particular message about the many critics I've had in my life. I can remember at what my very first uh, or my second pastorate, I had a lady I was working on a project to get the gospel out into the community. And we were going to write a little book and, uh, uh, about a young lady in our church who'd been through a lot. And I remember her coming up to me and she said, you can't write a book. What are you talking about? And she did it in the nicest way. But her way, she became the instrument to cause doubt. And I'm like, well, why can't we write a book? Why can't we share this story? Why can't we share the gospel? I remember in that same church, I had people uh, come and say, you can't have a prayer ministry. You can't have a prayer room. You can't, and you can't. And I'm telling you, I can go down through the list. And we worked through those things with those people. We loved them uh, well. We trusted God. Those things came about and accomplished the purpose they were supposed to accomplish. But I'm telling you, sometimes people say things, they may mean it, they may not mean it, but the words that come out of their mouth are faith killers. And then you have to grapple with that. Oh, I can't? But yet God put this on my heart, and I've already said here's where we need to go and what we need to do. I I think back through every situation in my life, from my call to ministry to going to seminary to pastoring this church or doing youth work and pastoring this church and this church and doing this. And in every ministry situation, there's someone that steps up to tell you God can't do it. And when I look back, I see how God did it. And it's amazing to see the activity of God. And there's so many people, some people are just geared that way. They're just more negative or they don't have the faith or they haven't been in the Word to see how God works. And then He calls us to these things that are out of our realm to accomplish, yet we trust Him and He does things that are impossible. That's just how God works. And I want to ask you, what is it that's been said to you that you cannot do, but yet God wants to do it? Verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one, underline this, lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Now, you got to think about the words of that. What he's saying to Saul, who is the head over the whole deal, and to every fighting man that is older than him, that is serving in the army, he's going, come on guys, don't lose heart. Trust God. He can do it. And I want to ask this question, how many believers at some point in their life, they lose heart? How many people just give up? And when the giant comes out, they run. Nobody sees a solution. Nobody can see how God is greater than whatever it is that we're facing. And and the equation of the activity of God is erased. David, this young shepherd boy, says, don't lose heart. In fact, I'm not just saying that. I'll do something about it. I'll go fight him. This is amazing faith that he has and he demonstrates. But not only was he demonstrating this amazing faith and the things that he said, he faces some unbelievable criticism. There's two. We want to look at both of them. The first I want to address is Elab's angry rejection. Look at verses 28 and 29. This is from this family member. This is from his brother. And when Elab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? So he's full of anger, and he asks this question, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now, what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? 
So why is it that the faith of another person creates anger in someone else? Why is that? You know, oftentimes we think, well, I'm going to serve the Lord, and, and I finally come to this place in my own life, and I want to do something for God, and I know other people are going to be excited about it, and here we go, I'm finally going to do the right thing, and then you go to do the right thing, and somebody just shoots you down. Why is that? I'll tell you why. It's not personal, it's spiritual. When you do God's work, and you do it His way, you're entering into a spiritual work that comes under attack we got to realize it's not personal, it's spiritual. That's probably one of the greatest points that helped me in ministry. I can continue to love people that say, you can't do that. Well, let's see what God will do. But I, I'm not going to get angry with you like you may be angry with me. I'm just going to take my hat off like Mr. Spurgeon did and say, well, I'm just glad there's, there's anything great about me. I'm just going to put this in perspective. And I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to love you ongoing and we're going to see what God's going to do. you got to learn how to do that in ministry. The second thing is we've got to realize that fear causes others to feel insecure and it causes them to battle against your faith because they don't have the faith you have but yet they don't want you having faith. So they battle against you out of their own insecurity. And thirdly, you've got to realize those driven by fear are protectors of their own reputation, not God's reputation. They're not looking at it from God's point of view. You've got to realize there may be a religious aspect to them. They may acknowledge God, but they've not surrendered to God, made themselves available to God, and so they battle to protect their own reputation instead of God's reputation. See, David, this was all about not David showing, I'm a great fighting man, and I'm going to be elevated in the, in the military, and my family's going to be exempt from taxes, and I get a woman, and I'm going to get to marry. And, and none of that many things to him. This was all about the glory of God. And that's why he was so free in it. So it's so hard, listen, to deal with critics that come from our family and our friends. But this is not a new thing. You know, Jesus had to deal with the fact that Judas would betray him, didn't he? How hurtful was that? So what are you to do about the Judases in life and the Elabs in life and the other critics that come our way? Well, I think you should do what Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, the Bible tells us that he would not entrust himself to men. That doesn't mean he didn't trust men, didn't love men. He didn't want to invest in men, but he didn't entrust himself to men. See, when you put men above God, and their opinion above God's opinion, you're entrusting yourself to men over entrusting yourself to God. It is in John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 that we learn this principle from Jesus. He said, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. I, listen, I love y'all, and I know that many of you love me, and some of you may not like me. But here's the thing, is I love God most, and God comes first, and my relationships with human beings come second. And I accept the fact that we're all human, and we may be walking in the Spirit, or we may not be walking in the Spirit, and that's okay. I mean, it's not okay that you're not walking in the Spirit, understand. But I understand that you may not be, and there's times when I'm not. And that's the fact that I'm human and you're human, and we can all come under temptation. We all may be used by the enemy if we don't surrender to the Lord, is my point. But my first responsibility is to my relationship with my faithful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God. And then I can put it into perspective. That's what Jesus is saying. Here, Elab, though, the big brother, who's filled to overflowing with criticism, and he's set on fire by anger, conducts his public verbal smackdown. This is a hostile attack. You've got to envision this among the other fighting men. This hostile attack with words tore through the air, attacking David's faith. Elab is a doubter, a downer, a doomsdayer, determined to discourage and defeat David's faith because he will not be embarrassed by his little brother who says, I'll go fighting. No way. No, we're not going to have that. We've got to stop this. What Elab is doing here is he questions David's motives. Why have you come down here? But let me tell you something. David's motives were pure. It's done shaking. All he says is, now, what have I done? What have I done? That's all he says. I can't even speak. 
But he comes and he questions his motives. If you have great faith for God, somebody's going to question your motive. Secondly, Elab, the older brother, is trying to parent the younger brother, David. And he scolds him for leaving his few sheep in the desert. He's degrading him like, who are you to come out here? Go go back to your few little sheep. You, You don't have any relevance here. You're not a fighting man. And then thirdly, he goes after his character by attacking the spiritual condition of his heart. He's basically calling him conceited and that his heart is wicked. Boy, that's an older brother that'll just bless you to death, right? Goodness gracious. Those are the kind you want to say, listen, you're not my parent and you're not God. But David doesn't do that. David just knows who he is. And this verbal beat down in front of the other soldiers is brutal. The belittling is terrible. So what did David do? How did he handle this? It's amazing. Listen, listen, this is amazing. Most of us go crawl under a rock or we would begin to verbally fight. But what does David do? His faith is unmoved. It's amazing that he's not drawn into this verbal battle. Proverbs 15, 1 would be true of him that a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And it causes me to ask myself the question, how do I handle being criticized by those close to me? We should really stop and think about that because it says something about our relationship with God. If I'm really trusting God. I want you to choose right now not to let the negative critics in your life stop God's work in your life. Don't be drawn into the verbal battle. Don't debate the work of God. Do the work of God. One man says you can't while God says you can. What David understood is this. Elab's thoughts and his comments, his belittling, his berating of him was not worth even dealing with because there was a greater cause. And the greater cause was the glory of the living God and relationship to this giant who is defying the living God. We can so quickly get sidetracked. we got to stop blaming the big brother, and we got to start believing the living God and what he will do. David was determined to trust God, not be deterred by this critical big brother Elab. And I say that because oftentimes we want to fight the critic, and really we just need to put it in perspective and move on and do God's work. Does that make sense? The English evangelist George Whitfield, who served in the 1700s, he learned that it was more important to please God than to please men. Knowing that he was doing what was honoring the Lord kept him from discouragement when he was falsely accused by his enemies. And at one point in his ministry, Whitfield received a vicious letter accusing him of wrongdoing. And I want to read you his reply. His reply was brief and it was courteous. And here's what he wrote back. I thank you heartily for your letter. As for what you and my other enemies are saying against me, I know worse things about myself than you will ever say about me. With love in Christ, George Whitfield. (laughs) Don't you love that? He didn't try to defend himself. He was much more concerned with pleasing God. We need to learn how to put our critics into perspective. The third thing I want us to see and ponder is this, is Saul's skeptical of rejection of David. Verse 32 and 33 says this, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight for him. And Saul's reply to him was this, you are not able to go out against this Philistine. Oh, that'll get you. And fight him. You are only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. See, word gets to Saul that there's a man willing to fight Goliath. I bet he was so excited. He said, man, my bribes are going to work. I'm going to be able to pay off somebody to get rid of this giant. He must have been so excited. But can you imagine his reaction when the boy, the boy, The little boy, David, that no one had respect for, steps into his tent. He can't believe it. Is this some kind of joke? He said, you're not, what? What, you're not able? 
You, you can't go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. Th- this, this giant, he's been fighting since his youth. Look at him. He's big. He's over nine feet tall, 150 pounds of armor. He, he, there's just no way. <clears throat> Let me say something. Whatever your age, whatever your size, whatever your background, just remember, others may doubt you, but God is waiting to work through you. There'll always be a doubter somewhere close by waiting to discourage you. Saul's words are clear. You, <laughs> you little boy, you can't do this. But David responds with the facts of God's. See, this is the key. Now, this is not just him being overconfident. Now, sometimes when we're young, we're just overconfident in ourselves. We think we can do more than we can. I'm not talking about that. What you got to see here is that David is responding with the facts of God's activity in his life. He tells him, he says, listen, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. That's the activity of God. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me, see, the Lord did this. I, he's not taking credit for himself. He didn't say, look at the great lion killer I am. Look at the great bear killer I am. Look how strong and wise I am. No, no, no. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He is responding to him with the activity of God in his life. Uh, my family, my side of the family came into town yesterday to spend some time with Elizabeth before she leaves. And we were all sitting around yesterday talking. We began to talk about different stories of how God had worked and God had done things. And, and I, was just, I was just soaking it up because it's such a great encouragement to see and know the activity of God in your life. And, and it's a confidence builder to say, God did that. I, I didn't do it, but God did that. And see, so when, we, when we remember those things and we live in the reality of those things, we can say with confidence what, what God has already done in, in my life, reality, God can do it again, right? Do you believe that, church? God can do it again. He's still alive. He's still working. He can still take on our giants. He can still deal with our critics. That's the kind of faith that David had. Young people, don't let people look down on you, but live in the reality of God's work in your life. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in your speech, in your life, your love, your faith, and in your purity. And if you're doing all those things, it's a picture of surrender to God, and you're living, trusting God. And if you're trusting God, don't let people look down on you. It's a beautiful verse. And that's what David said to Saul in verse 32. He said, don't let, don't let anybody lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Beautiful. Saul's skeptical rejection didn't stop him. Elab's angry rejection didn't stop him. He had this courageous faith. In closing, I want to say this to you. There's a saying that says this, and it's a true saying. If you wrestle with a pig, you'll both get dirty. I've never wrestled with a pig. You know, this is a true story. I sat by a pig on a couch one time, went to make a visit at a home with a friend. He said, come on, Mark, I want you to meet some neighbors of mine. I said, okay. I went and sat on the couch, and underneath this blanket appears this huge pig. He sat up and looked at me, and we just sat on the couch together. I said, this is a first for me. I've sat on a couch with a pig, but I've never wrestled with one. But if you wrestle with a pig, you'll both get dirty. Now, why am I saying all that? Because David did not wrestle with Elab or Saul. His faith held strong in the storms of criticism. Let me tell you these five things in wrapping this up. And I want to say one last thing to you. But one, know who you are in Christ. That helps everything. Let God define you, not someone else. Secondly, bless those that curse you and pray for those that persecute you. You say, why? Because the Bible says so. Thirdly, believe God, not the opinion of people. Fourthly, hurting people hurt people. Don't take it personal. 
Press on. There is a greater cause. It is the will of God. And then fifthly, words are weapons and insults come from those who are insecure. The story is told of a judge who had been frequently ridiculed by a conceited lawyer. When asked by a friend why he didn't rebuke his assailant, he replied. Here's what he said. He said, in our town lives a widow who has a dog. And whenever the moon shines, it goes outside and it barks all night. Having said that, the magistrate shifted the conversation to another subject. Finally, someone asked, but judge, what about the dog and the moon? Like, what was that? Oh, he replied, the moon went on shining. That's all. You may have some dogs barking and howling in your life. But I want to say this to you. Just keep on shining for Jesus, trusting him to do the great work he desires to do in and through your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.